Welcome back to the channel folks, my name's Shane. I'm gonna give you my list for the seven things I've learned about electric guitar gear, whether it be pedals, amplifiers, or guitars. Now this won't cover any acoustic stuff. This is primarily just for electric guitar players. I've been playing 20 years. I can't believe it's 20 years already. I've been doing YouTube for such a long time, since about 2006. And since then I've tested thousands of items both on the channel and outside of the channel. I've owned and traded and sold and bought lots of items that never made it onto the YouTube channel as well. So there's plenty of experience there and this is just my opinion on the seven things I've learned about playing electric guitar. Let's get into it. The first thing I wanna share on this list is something I'm sure a lot of people who might have subscribed to the channel can agree with, that not all solid state amplifiers are bad. Solid state amps get a really bad rap for really realistically only one reason. Uh, there's a lot of junk ones <laughs> but if you can find a good one whether it be a pv bandit a roland jazz chorus a fender deluxe plus 112 a studio pro 112 or any of these kind of amplifiers they're gig worthy they sound great in a live mix they sound awesome with pedals and they just work and that's one of the differences between those and a junk amplifier you can say the same thing about valve amps while there's a lot of great valve slash tube amps out there you know there's a lot of junk ones as well that i would never take out and play live same thing with solid state amps, except the scale's the other way around. There's more junk solid state amps than there are quality ones. But if you find a quality solid state amp, they sound unreal and they're generally a fair bit lighter and they'll respond extremely well in a live mix. So the first thing on this list, not all solid state amps are bad. The second thing I have to add to this list is next year's guitars won't be any better. Now that's not to say some quality control things might change, but generally a guitar is still a guitar every single year. And I wanted to put this in here because I feel it's kind of relevant. Every time NAM comes out, we see so much NAM spam go up on YouTube that and hype behind stuff that isn't really justified. It's the same thing with a different paint job. Odds are the guitar you already have is fine. So stick with that. You probably don't need to keep buying a new guitar every year. And now I'm guilty of this too. I buy guitars, but I buy different ones. I don't just buy the same thing year after year. Like if there's a Fender Strat, I had the standard Mexican one. I'm not gonna go out and buy a Player Series one because I already have a Strat and that's going to be fine. So don't get caught up in the hype train. Next year's guitars aren't gonna be any better. Now this third item on the list is something that I think might be one of the most important things on here. And that's that tone is in the hands and it's also in your head. So what do I mean by that? you got to have a sound in your head that you're wanting to achieve, right? And that's one of the most important things in terms of actual tone. But the tone itself greatly improves if you can play well. If you're an average or below average player and you've got 30 different effects pedals, you're probably still not going to get the sound that you want out of all of them versus a player who can really play well can probably dial in their sound in a matter of seconds with any of those effects pedals as long as it's not a boss metal zone, right? But no, I'm only kidding. If you're a blues player, of course. But the trick is to be able to hear a sound in your head, but the other trick is to also have great picking dynamics in your hands and great feel. And that's where that comes from and stems from. I've seen this for years on my channel. Anytime I test out a new pedal, a lot of people say, hey, it still sounds like you, it still sounds the same. That's because I'm dialing in a sound that's in my head and I've got some tone in my hands. It probably still needs a lot of improvement, but there's a bit of that there. If I take a new amplifier out and I play live, a lot of guys say, hey, it sounds great, but it still sounds the same. So there's a, a sort of correlation there between the hands giving you the playing and the head, which means like the sound that you have that you're trying to nail. If you can get a good combination of that, you'll sound great with anything that you buy as opposed to keep buying stuff to try to make you sound better. It's all in the hands, all in the head. Number four on this list is digital multi effects processor pedals and why they're not for me. So there's a couple of things that always stop any all-in-one multi-effects pedal from being perfect, and it always comes down to the user experience. There's something really great about having your analog or even a digital single pedal on the floor, like a Strymon or something like that, or a delay pedal, in your chain of actual effects on a pedal board that is just so much more usable and functional than having any of those multi-effects pedals on the floor. Now there might be a couple of exceptions out there for pedals I haven't played or tried before, but I really feel like all of the ones I've tried so far aren't anywhere near as good tonally, nor are they anywhere near close to being as functional as my actual pedal board going into my amplifiers. So there's one kind of exception to this as well. If you're just a home studio user and you're going into a sound card, you can definitely use something like the Head Rush or the, 
the more G300 or any of those kind of things, they'll work in that kind of situation. But if you're a live player and you want to just go down and actually sort of modify a sound, it's a lot more complicated on a digital effects pedal than it is on an analog equivalent or, or a digital analog pedal that has the physical tangible knobs on it. So that's the way that I look at it. And one other thing I should throw in here as well, that all IRs, like impulse responses, aren't created equal. <laughs> that doesn't mean just because you've got an IR, it's gonna sound great. I've tested so many that it does. So yeah, don't think that just because something can handle IRs, it instantly makes it better. Now, one thing I've learned in my own experience, not only playing a Kemper profiling amp live, but also trying out the more G200 in a live situation direct to the PA system, is that having an analog amp simulation pedal sounds just as good or better. I think in terms of tone, the Kemper's probably still the best at what it does, but then the American sound, which is worth 20 bucks, comes in right under it, but the user experience of having a tangible pedal on the floor that's a lot easier to edit than trying to fiddle with the controls on the Kemper far outweighed <laughs> any loss of tone, and at the end of the day, nobody cared. So if you can get your hands on one of those American sound pedals from Joyo or any other those clone companies out there, it's definitely worth checking out. I would use them any day of the week over, and with my regular pedal board, over any digital effect direct to the PA system. This fifth thing on the list is something that I've been doing a lot more of lately, and recently on the channel I posted a video saying the great guitar purge of 2020, which means I'm getting rid of a lot of stuff I'm not using, and I'm gonna replace some of those items with stuff that will stand the test of time long term. Now, I think a lot of people make the mistake, and I'm guilty of this as well, when I first started playing, you know, I'd buy a Squire, which is a great guitar, and then I'd buy something else in, in between that guitar and then the one that I actually ended up with at the end. And I've done that a few times where you end up spending more money on three different inexpensive guitars than you would just getting the one that you originally wanted. Now, I know financially not everyone can go out and buy the, the guitar that they wanted straight away, and I couldn't do that either. So that's why I took those steps. But if you're in a position where you can spend up to you know, the amount of money you would want to spend on a long-term guitar, do it that way. Think long-term. Think, if I buy this, am I going to have it in 10 years or am I only going to have it for a year or six months or three months? I've seen guys, you know, they buy stuff and then they flip it within three months. It's just a waste of money. Try to think about it long-term. And my clear example of this is I'm only looking for guitars now that I know I'll have for 10 years or more, right? So I'm looking for long-term guitars. And I want those guitars to stand up to my standard of guitar playing as of right now without going too overboard. So I never want to just go out and blow 10 grand on a custom shop guitar because that's overkill for me. So you've got to weigh up what's justifiable versus what you think you're going to keep long-term as opposed to buying three or four other guitars that would cost the same amount or less, but without the whole buy and sell thing. So yeah, think a little bit long-term with any gear that you buy. It's definitely the best way to go. Number six on this list kind of relates to something that I was just talking about before. It's the law of diminishing returns. So what does that mean? It means the curve between buying something good and buying something great is far less than buying something good and buying something that's totally crap. The curve goes up and then it just gradually goes up. So you'll get less back on the amount of money you spend the more you spend on a guitar. And I don't care if this is the same for PRS, Fender, Gibson, any of these brands, if you're starting to spend 10 grand plus, it's not gonna be that much better of a guitar than one that would cost four grand, if at all, right? And this is all subjective stuff. A really great example of this is I've recently purchased a Gibson Les Paul Special with two P90 pickups. Now, about five years ago or so, or four years ago, I had a Gibson VOS Custom Shop 56 reissue with P90s, it was a gold top, really beautiful guitar, and that's considered sort of like a mid-range, mid I guess, Gibson, whereas this one would be kind of like, a, I guess, an entry-level one to some extent. I guarantee you this, I'm not gonna sound any different on either, and both play as well as each other. So, what are you spending your money on, really? Just the finish? The great thing about the new one is it's actually lighter. So, so make sure, firstly, you buy with your ears, and buy with your hands as well, and you'll get a great guitar, and the law of diminishing returns is absolutely a real thing. And it's like that with any industry. If you're talking about cameras, you can spend X amount of money and it's not really gonna give you that much more than the one under it. So yeah, shop smart. And lastly, number seven on this list is sell what you don't use. Now this might be obvious to some people out there, but I see it time and time again, man. People I know keep guitars for 10 years and they don't play them. I just find that pointless. Now for me personally, decluttering is good for the soul. You know, I got a spare room here. 
that I had all these boxes and guitars sitting in. And you know what? Getting rid of them was just awesome. I walk past that room and I look in there and it's looking very, very tidy and clean. And they're things that I haven't missed at all. I'm not sure what the attachment process is for a lot of people when they have trouble selling stuff they're not using. But for me personally, decluttering is one of the best things you can do. It just, you know, it's like having a tidy workspace when you work. It feels better than having junk all around you. At least that's the way that I look at it. The other reason why this is also a really great thing, coming back to point number five, you can find something that you'll actually use as opposed to just having something under the bed or having it in the spare room or leaving it in the cupboard that you might actually use long term. And that's always a good thing. Get rid of the stuff you're not playing, put it in someone else's hands that will use it. It's always good having a bit of extra cash. Take that cash, go overseas, do something fun if you can, if you can do that, or put it into something that you'll actually play and enjoy long term. I don't understand why people just hoard stuff in cupboards and under beds if they're not using it. For me, that's just, it doesn't make any sense. And if you're one of those guys, let me know in the comments why you do that. I get it, some people are actual collectors. I'm not a collector. I like to go out and play live. I like to use my instruments. I like to record stuff here at the house, make videos as well, and albums. So I use a lot of my instruments and the ones that I don't use go. And if you missed my Purge video, like I said, links up in the cards, you can check that out. So yeah, that's my list of seven things I've learned about electric guitar gear, guitars, amplifiers, and pedals. If you agree or disagree, let me know in the comments below. I've really thought about this list over the last couple of weeks and really wanted to put this together because I feel like not enough people are talking about some of the points on here, especially when it comes to tone being in the hands and you know just their thoughts about it. So hopefully this, this is relevant for a lot of folks. If you did enjoy the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, click the bell, all that kind of thing. Now, a while back, I actually posted a bit of a fun video about the five worst design elements on an electric guitar. If you missed that, I'll also leave a link up here. You can check that out. Thanks again for watching. My name's Shane. I'll catch you soon. See ya.